Hello, dear friends. This is Dr. Minakshi Sundaram, AS, MBBS, MD. And the current topic we're discussing would be respiratory chain, electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation. And this completely comes under a bigger topic called as biological oxidation. Remember, biological oxidation drives our living. We are living right now because of one concept that whatever the kind of fuel we have, it has to be burned inside the body and that burning is referred to as combustion in scientific terms and combustion is technically burning something in the presence of oxygen. So if at all you have to think about one molecule that actually involves in any kind of burning, you think about oxygen. And remember, without oxygen, the respiratory chain is not going to give you the maximum kind of benefit that you're expecting. So that brings us to the question, if you think about any organelle in your cell, who would be the best suited for oxidation or oxidative phosphorylation? The answer turns out to be mitochondria. Okay, so what is the purpose of us breathing every single day in and out? Every time I breathe in, I'm taking up oxygen. And when I breathe out, I'm giving out carbon dioxide. And what is the purpose? The oxygen is the one that propels the burning of any kind of fuel. And when it burns, it gives out carbon dioxide. And when it burns, it liberates energy. And that is the energy which is maximal when it comes through the respiratory or aerobic respiration that is from mitochondria. What happens in anaerobic respiration? You don't have much of oxygen playing ability because of which ATP synthesis will not be optimum in case of anaerobic metabolism. So for aerobic metabolism to happen, you have to depend on mitochondria. And what is mitochondria? Do we actually own mitochondria? The eukaryotic cells contain mitochondria, but they do not own it. Eukaryotic cells cannot own the mitochondria. We have them, but we don't own them. Why am I saying this? Because there is a theory called as endosymbiotic theory. What does it tell you? Thousands and thousands of years back, mitochondria was not actually a mitochondria. It was one of the aerobic bacteria who got trapped inside the eukaryotic or a prokaryotic cell. That trapping actually proved beneficial to each other. So the cell benefited from the bacteria and the bacteria benefit from the cell. Both of them had a symbiotic relationship and it started continuing for a long time. So right now, even now, when I have mitochondria in my own eukaryotic cell, that mitochondria evolutionarily is not mine. It is another bacteria who is staying inside my body for thousands of years. And why do I say this? This mitochondria is not a beautiful thing to actually think of. It is a very complicated thing to think of. And that complication is the reason behind the beauty. Let me tell you the different kinds of layers you have in case of mitochondria, as you already know. If I'm supposed to draw a diagram, we'll be having an outer mitochondrial membrane. We'll be having something called as inner mitochondrial membrane. And between the two mitochondrial membranes, I'll be having something called as intermembranous space. Now, the inner mitochondrial membrane can actually extend deeper into the matrix. Okay, the center part, what you're writing here is matrix. So, one that actually projects into the matrix would be referred to as the cristae. These are the four major labeling that is supposed to be done for mitochondria. Okay, what are the different enzymes that we have to know which are present in case of mitochondria? See, when you're learning about metabolism, you understand that most of the glycolytic reactions or glycolysis as such happens in cytoplasm. Gluconeogenesis can have partly in cytoplasm and mitochondria. But when it comes to electron transport chain, it happens in mitochondria. When it comes to tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle called as TCA cycle, it happens in mitochondria. So when you want something to be burned at a higher energy level, by expecting absolute amount of ATP to come back to you, then you think of mitochondria. Even beta oxidation of fatty acids where a palmitic acid is capable of producing immense amount of ATP, it has to happen in the mitochondria. So the bottom line, when you're going for mitochondria, it is going to be a burning process. It is an oxidizing process. At the end of it, you can actually return with a lot of ATPs. So on that basis, let us discuss the most important theoretical information before we just go into the electron transport chain per se. The outer mitochondrial membrane is something that contains acyl-CoA synthetase. This is outer mitochondrial membrane. And why do you call it as synthetase? Because when you have any kind of fatty acid, you call them as 
acyl groups. Fatty acid is the acyl group, but this is not active as such. So you want to make it active. So you give a tail for the acyl group in the form of pantothenic acid, which is in the form of coenzyme A. So when you add the coenzyme A to the acid, it becomes acyl CoA. That requires some amount of energy. That is why to synthesize acyl CoA, you require ATP. And any kind of reaction where you're trying to synthesize a new compound and ATP is generated, you use the enzyme's name as synthetase. And synthetase belongs to the class of ligases. So, in case of outer mitochondrial membrane, we have the enzyme called as acyl CoA synthetase that helps in the beginning of the whole process of beta oxidation. The next and foremost important enzyme in the outer mitochondrial membrane would actually be glycerol phosphate acyl transferase. We'll be seeing this in else other areas. Now, let's focus on the inner mitochondrial membrane and the components of it. The inner mitochondrial membrane is known for specific enzymes like electron carriers. For example, complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, complex 4, all these which are involved in the electron transport chain. They are actually present as electron carriers in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Along with that, you also be having ATP synthetase or ATP synthase complex. Different authors will be using different names, but you have to know the synthesis of ATP using a complex, which is also referred to as complex 5, is present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Then you have one more kind of translocase enzymes. Remember, translocase is class 7. In case of enzymology classification, we have OTHLIL, O T H L I L. O stands for oxidorectases class 1, T stands for transferases class 2, you have hydrolase which is class 3, lyase class 4, isomerase class 5 and ligases class 6. So I spoke about acyl CoA synthetase which is class 6 ligase. When you speak about translocase enzyme, it is a newly added kind of class called as translocases as such. So translocase enzymes which are actually membrane transporters are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Membrane transporters. And that brings us to the last and final component of a mitochondria referred to as the mitochondrial matrix. The ultimate depth reached inside a mitochondria. It happens to be in the matrix, the quishy mushy layer of mitochondria. And that is known for containing TCA cycle enzymes. It also contains the fatty acid oxidation. Most commonly, it is beta oxidation the enzymes involved in the beta oxidation. So now you might be slightly confused. Then why you spoke about acyl CoA synthetase, which is also a part of beta oxidation. See, you will be having always an activation step where the fatty acid is becoming a fatty acyl CoA, only then it can go into the matrix of the mitochondria where it can burn completely. But for the fatty acid to enter into the matrix, you require certain enzymes to activate them. And those enzymes are present in the outer mitochondrial membrane. Next, we can also focus on the PDH complex, the brilliant PDH complex. Now, to understand PDH complex better, please focus on the vitamins chapter where we speak about vitamin B1, which is thiamine, whose active form is thiamine pyrophosphate. And that thiamine pyrophosphate acts as a coenzyme for the enzymes like PDH complex, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, and branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase complex, along with that of transketolase enzymes. So, all these are extremely interrelated. And that is what is the beauty of the subject called as bio chemistry. Once you get the hang of what exactly the topic is, then you'll be able to introduce new information to the topic and expand the topic as widely as possible and as deeply as possible. And once the authoritative signature comes from your side towards a particular topic, your understanding of the topic and the way by which you can answer the questions can be levitated to a higher level. And that is what I want from you when you come to my classes. Now, we'll go for the pictures here. I'll be discussing picture-based questions or picture-based discussions in terms of pictures taken from standard books like Harper and Vasudevan. So this is one such picture. This is just a representation of what I drew just now. We have the outer membrane here. And these projections are the cristae. And this is the intermembrane space between this area and this area. And we have the matrix. Okay, now let's move forward. This is about the structural organization of components of the respiratory chain and FO, F1, ATPase in the mitochondrial membrane. 
So when you go for the electron transport chain per se, I want you to focus on the different components of the electron transport chain. Okay, now what do you mean by different components of electron transport chain? First, you have to know how the electron transport chain starts and where it finishes and what are the complexes and the arrangement of it. And when I keep saying that, the electron transport chain starts from a lower redox potential area and ends up in the higher redox potential area, that will bring you a question. What do you mean by redox potential? And why exactly it is moving from lower redox area to a higher redox area? That brings us to the question about oxidation and reduction per se as a process that is to be understood in case of biological oxidation. So be with me as I discuss these kind of things here. Listen. This particular tabular column is to show you some redox potentials of special interest in mammalian oxidation systems. What does it tell you? If we speak about H plus and H2, this will be having a voltage difference of minus 0.42. Now, try to compare that with the cytochrome B with the F3 plus or F2 plus combination, which will give me a EW or E slash O or E prime O voltages. Now, that brings us to the question, what is voltage? Voltage means potential difference. Voltage is potential difference. Remember, higher the voltage difference, the more the voltage, then automatically the flow of reaction happens even more spontaneously. For example, if a fellow is standing in this top area and he wants to move here. On the other example, the fellow is standing here and he wants to come here. According to your common sense logic, you understand that a fellow who can roll off this tall building can happen faster and this fellow can happen less spontaneously than this fellow. So if at all between two points, the difference is very huge, then flow of things from one direction to the other direction towards the lower side will always happen faster, right? That is what has been told here. So we speak about H plus and H2, the voltage difference is minus 0.42. When it comes to cytochrome, it is plus 0 0.008. So this is just an example to tell you where the redox pairs can happen. What do you mean by redox pair? Think about it. We have NAD plus and NADH, which can help you understand things faster. I'll use a simple chemical reaction where we have CH3, C double bond O, COOH, which is nothing but pyruvate. And we have another compound called as lactate which is CH3, CHOH, COOH. If we ask you to find the difference between these two, it is happening in this area where you understand that the number of H molecules present in lactate is more. So to the C also you have added a H, to the O also you have added a H. That means when pyruvate is becoming lactate, you had an NADH molecule coming into the picture along with the H plus and came out as NAD plus. Now, if I'm looking for the opposite reaction, if NAD plus is going to become NADH plus H plus, then this NAD is going to take up the H from here so that lactate can become pyruvate. At this point of time, you realize that where NAD plus and NADH plus H plus is a pair by themselves. So if NADH plus H plus can lose the hydrogen, it can give the hydrogen to somebody who wants to be reduced. While NAD plus is getting the hydrogen from someone, that means NAD is taking the hydrogen in that process, it is oxidizing that someone. So this would be referring to the oxidoreductase pairs. So you want to understand the potential difference between the two pairs and see whether they are capable of acting as very good pairs in accepting and losing hydrogen in that process, the electrons also comfortably or less comfortably. So another point of concern here I want you to focus is every time I say a H plus has been lost, it is to be understood that an electron also is lost. That brings us to the question, the basic definition of oxidation and reduction. Look at this here. I will make it as simple as possible. We have oxidation on one side. We have reduction on the other side. What are the different ways by which you can use the word oxidation? Oxidation involves addition of oxygen. So the opposite is reduction, right? So it is removal of oxygen. In case of oxidation, it can be removal of hydrogen. In case of reduction, it is addition of hydrogen. 
and in case of oxidation it can be loss of electrons at the same time reduction is addition of electrons so when a substrate is gaining hydrogen it also means it is gaining electrons so when a substrate gains either hydrogen or electrons as a combination it is getting reduced so this is the table that i want you to use for the rest of your lives whenever you have questions or doubts regarding whether a compound is getting oxidized or reduced okay now this table is just for your reference to know what can the pair stand as a electrovalent pair. Okay, now here, this is oxidation of metabolite catalyzed by an oxidase A forming water and forming hydrogen peroxide. Whenever you say oxidation and reduction, there have been multiple types of oxidation reductions. This picture is just to show you what kind of things you can expect. Now say for example, we are starting with a compound called as AH2. This AH2, because of the purpose of having H on its side, it is already reduced. So that is what is called as red. Do not take it as a color. Here the RED means reduced form of the A. Now when this H2 has been taken up by somebody else, who is it somebody? A half a molecule of oxygen. Why do I say it as half a molecule of oxygen? Because I want to go for a stoichiometric satisfaction. Because I can't say O atom is coming inside, right? For that reason I say it as half a molecule of oxygen. So when two hydrogens will come together with a half a molecule of oxygen, ultimately I get a water molecule. This is a type of oxidase. Now there is one more type of oxidase where if I say AH2, a singlet atom is not coming and not a half a molecule of oxygen is coming, a full molecule of oxygen is coming and that full molecule of oxygen is taking up two hydrogen atoms that can give rise to H2O2. So these are the two types of oxidizing activities that can happen where on oxidation, that is a reduced compound is getting oxidized. In that process, the H2 has been lost to the oxygen. When the H2 is lost to a single oxygen atom, that is half a molecule of oxygen, you get water. If it is happening to the full molecule of oxygen, you get hydrogen peroxide. These are the two results or products of a particular oxidation reaction. Now that brings us to the question called as, who can be the different kinds of mediators for oxidation reduction other than reducing equivalence? That brings us to another question. What is the meaning of the word reducing equivalence See, I spoke about pyruvate becoming lactate, etc. Right here, when this pyruvate is becoming lactate, you had an NADH being used up where NAD plus has been generated. That doesn't mean you are creating a new kind of NAD molecule. It is the same NAD which initially had hydrogen, right now has been stripped off hydrogen. Now, when the same NAD is going back to the formation of NADH plus H plus, I have generated the NADH plus H plus, which is nothing but an addition of two atoms of hydrogen which is the equivalent of two elements of or two electrons. Now when they enter into the electron transport chain, every NADH molecule is worth 2.5 ATP which you have learned from first year MBBS or even since school. So I say if NADH has been generated, I am saying it is the equivalent of having 2.5 ATP. Only then I call it as reducing equivalence. So what are the most common reducing equivalents we use? On one side, we have NAD plus and an NADH plus H plus pair or I can have an FAD plus with a FAD H2 pair or I can have FMN slash FMN H2 pair. Now, the one that is not really involved in electron transport chain and ATP synthesis would be NADPH and the NADP where the NADPH plus would be having a extra proton with them. This one is also reducing equivalent, but it is not meant for ATP synthesis in general. Okay, now let's look at the picture here. Now let's look at this picture, which is Flavin, who is exhibiting a quinone-like structure. Generally, quinone-like structure belongs to the concept called as vitamin K. You might have heard of chloroquine, fluoroquines, minaquines, etc., minaquinone, etc. All these kind of compounds have something in common in terms of the ring in the aromatic structure. Here, we are focusing on the quinine-like structure which resembles or similar to that of vitamin K, which is incorporated into a flavin activity. Here, this compound is called as oxidized flavin, which is referred to as just FAD. I told you the redox partners, right? FAD on reduction becomes FADH2. NAD on reduction becomes NADH plus H plus. So, this is the way flavin can look like when it is oxidized. Where, if I go for subsequent addition of hydrogen, 
Every time I tell you when there is an addition of hydrogen, recollect I am speaking about the addition of electron also. So here I say I am adding a hydrogen atom and I am adding an electron. So with that you will be having one hydrogen coming and sticking to the head of the nitrogen present on the surface of flavin. That makes it one hydrogen added to one of the two nitrogens that are present in the semiquinone derivative or FAD. Here you had this nitrogen already blocked with the R group which can be as small as a methyl group or it can be as long as a 10 carbon hydrocarbon. Here we are focusing only on these two nitrogens which are capable of accepting hydrogen. The first nitrogen to accept the hydrogen would be this one. When this has accepted the nitrogen because of electron sink property you will be having electron jutting out at this nitrogen. So when I push it further for more reduction then the extra hydrogen can be taken up here. Now this nitrogen also has a hydrogen. This is said to be completely reduced form of flavin. This is where you call it as FADH2. Here the point of concern is that the both hydrogen atoms are a part of the ring itself. But this is not the same in case of NAD. In case of NAD, one of the hydrogen will come and bind to the ring hydrogen while the other hydrogen atom will be outside though it is closely related. That is why I always have to write it as NADH plus H plus. But in case of FAD, both the hydrogen have gotten into the ring where each of the hydrogen has been bound to the nitrogen which is already free and that is what I get it as reduced flavin as FADH2. So when FAD has become FADH2, it means this hydrogen was knocked off from a substrate. That substrate, if it was AH2, it is becoming A. That would mean to say that the AH2 substrate has actually been oxidized to A. So I get an oxidized substrate. This is what happens with the help of a intermediate reducing equivalent called as FAD+. Now this will help you understand the concepts of P40 or P450 based kind of reduction reactions. In case of cytochrome proteins, we have class 1 P450, class 2 and cytochrome B5. What is the meaning of 450? Please remember, it means that particular cytochrome protein has maximum amount of absorption during the 450 nanometer wavelength hitting it. It will not be responding to much of other wavelengths starting from 320 or till 720. In that zone, 450 nanometers is that particular wavelength at which that protein is capable of giving you maximum absorption and response. So those kind of proteins are referred to as cytochrome P450 enzymes where the class 1 is involved in NADPH. Now this NADPH or you can also call it as NADH. Remember, every time they write NAD, with a P in the bracket along with the H, it indicates that you can either take it as NADH or you can take it as NADPH. That is what I want you to remember. Okay, now this CP450 is undergoing a reductase action where it is not going for a direct P450 reductase, it's a general reductase which can convert FAD into FADH2. That would mean to say when the electrons are flowing, that is from FAD to FADH2, when the FADH2 is going back to the FAD, the electrons will be flowing which will move from Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. This Fe3 plus is highly oxidized state. By gaining the electrons and FADH2 went back to FAD, those electrons reduce the ion in such a way ferric has become ferrous. So here, the next step is you make it undergo hydroxylation reaction. Fe2S2 is a state to tell you that it is an iron sulfur complex. Remember, in case of all oxidative reactions or oxidoreductase reactions, you will expect something called as iron sulfur complex. For example, you would have heard about Rieske's complex, etc. It just means the iron and sulfur are bound to each other. They are not just a compound, it is just a complex. Compound means it would be like a salt. For example, if I say Na2SO4, it's a salt of sodium sulfate. But when I say Fe and S, these two elements are together. They are not actually a compound, but they are a complex, which can play with the electrons by accepting them or releasing them at will. Here, if Fe2S2 is the basis of oxidoreductase activity, we will be having the cytochrome P450 helping in the reduction of oxygen or helping in the oxidation of RH. So RH comes to O2, O2 is getting reduced. While O2 is coming to RH, the RH is getting oxidized. Ultimately, what do I get? The O2 will extract a hydrogen in such a way, half a molecule of oxygen can actually take up two hydrogen atoms to form a H2O. At the end, the remaining O can go between the R and H. If this is R, 
then the O comes and sits between the R and H. Now this compound is an alcohol and this will be a hydroxylation reaction. So one such oxidorectase activity because of class 1 P450 is a hydroxylation reaction. The same thing can happen with class 2 P450 activity also and the end product is again hydroxylation. But the difference is in case of class 1, I will be having the assistance of FAD becoming FADH2 in the propulsion forward. But in class 2, you'll be having FAD offering the electrons to FMN and the FMN becomes FMNH2. When the FMNH2 again goes back to become FMN, those electrons are the ones who will be propelling forward for hydroxylation reactions. So the bottom line, in case of class 1 P450 class of activity, you'll be having FAD becoming FADH2. In case of class 2, you'll be having FMN becoming FMNH2 with the help of FAD once again. Now, when you speak about cytochrome B5, you are not focusing on NADPH at all. It is purely NADH. And if it is NADH, using B5 reductase, the electrons from the NADH will be traveling to FAD. FAD becomes FADH2. There is no involvement of FMN in the straightforward sequence of B5 reductase, where the B5 reductase can help in the desaturation activity. where oleic acid, an unsaturated acid, is becoming a steric acid, which is a saturated form of acid. So here you have used the hydrogen for nullifying or satisfying a double bond. For example, if I have a C with a double bond here, the C has been involved everywhere. If I add one more hydrogen here, another hydrogen here, I'll be able to knock off the double bond into a single bond. So in that area, you will be requiring hydrogen, right? The hydrogen is supplied by NADH on FADH2. Also remember, if at all I'm going to use P450 reductase even on cytochrome B5, I'll be having FAD becoming FMN, becoming FMNH2. Those electrons are given to FAD, that becomes FADH2 and the process continues. And if it is moving on this direction, if it is still P450 activity, it can end up in hydroxylation. So you can look at this picture when you have time in a slower fashion. I speak about three types of classes of P450, that is cytochrome P450 enzymes. We have class 1, class 2. Then we have cytochrome B5 and cytochrome B5 in its linear process will be able to go for acyl CoA saturation and desaturation reactions. While if you go for P450 interference pathway, you will be having hydroxylation reactions, the end product as you see here and here. I hope you get this point. Now, this is the cytochrome P450 hydroxylase cycle. From the information you obtained in the previous slide, look at this slide. This should make your life of understanding the cytochrome slightly bit easier. Focus, we start with the substrate, which is actually a AH molecule. If it is AH, what does it mean? It is either fully reduced or partly reduced. Definitely it is having hydrogen. Now you have a cytochrome P450, which is having a bond with that of Fe3+. Okay, now in this case of cytochrome P450, we'll be utilizing NADPH. So try to recollect what we learned in the previous chapter. If it was class P450, it will definitely have NADH or NADPH in both the areas. Only with the cytochrome B5, you're focusing on NADH and not on NADPH. So we started with the cytochrome P450, right? Beta class 1 or class 2 doesn't matter. Right now, we are supposed to tell that we are focusing on NADP, which can become NADPH plus H plus on getting reduced. Okay. Now we start with the NADPH plus H plus. This, when it becomes NAD+, it loses the hydrogen to the FAD, so the FAD becomes FADH2. That FADH2 will be offering the hydrogen and the electrons to the iron sulfur complex. The complex is a cluster, it's not a compound. So, you will be having Fe2S2 with a 3 plus charge on receiving the hydrogen and electrons because the presence of a pair of electrons, the 3 plus has become 2 plus. Remember, you got two electrons along with that of two hydrogen and you had a two into Fe2 and S2 with a three plus. So when you add two electrons, you'll be able to reduce only one pair of the excess electrons so that the reduction has happened. When the reduction has happened, electrons went to the ion sulfur complex, but the hydrogen went along with the water to form. I mean, it came along with the oxygen to form H2O. So here you will be having water being formed when the hydrogen came towards oxygen. Now keep continuing with the pathway here. Now, if at all Fe2S2, which has become 2 plus, again wants to become oxidized, it has to lose the electrons. It gained the electron from FADH2, 
it will offer the electrons out. Who will be ready for accepting these electrons here? You have one more group of compounds called as cytochrome P450AH, which is bound with a Fe3+. How did you ever get this compound? This was what we began with. When we began, we had a P450 with an Fe3 plus ring at the area. You had a substrate which was a reduced substrate. When both of them came together, they created a complex which was P450AH with an Fe3 plus. The electron which was given by the Fe2S2 complex is taken up here so that this Fe3 plus has been altered into Fe2 plus. So what do I have here? A P450AH with an Fe2 plus. Now,